from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Tech. A new dairy processor prepares to open shop in Michigan. For a dairy farmer, we've been waiting for this for a long, long time. Fresh land valued numbers from across the country. It's rice harvest time in Louisiana. An agribusiness checking on wheat market potential. We've seen lower production in little pockets all around the world, and that's what we had said all along would take it to make the market go higher. And cowboy cops in Florida help corral an off-road caper. Ag Day. Presented by the Chevy Silverado, high strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. There hasn't been much to celebrate in the milk industry lately with low milk prices paid to farmers, a glut of milk in the global supply and trade challenges. But in Michigan, dairy producers are hopeful with the announcement of a new half billion dollar processing plant. Construction is expected to begin next month on a new cheese and whey facility in St. John's, Michigan, a town north of Lansing. It's a joint effort of Glambia Nutritionals, Dairy Farmers of America, and Select Milk Producers. The state of Michigan offering financial incentives and tax abatements to secure the deal. At a news conference Thursday, state economic leaders touted the project. The cost of the project about a half billion dollars. If you don't have a market right here, you had to ship it someplace else, and those, that was very expensive. So to be honest with you, over the last few years, we've had a challenge for our dairy farmers. It's been a tough haul. Now, according to our partners at Farm Journal's Milk, the plant will process 8 million pounds of milk a day. The owners intend to employ 250 people when it's fully operational, which would come in the year 2020. They've also entered an agreement with ProLiant Dairy Ingredients to produce the whey co-products. ProLiant says it intends to build a separate plant on the same site in St. John's. Now, according to USDA data, Michigan ranks sixth in milk production, and it's about to join the Billion Pound Club. The latest milk production report showing Michigan farmers produced 986 million pounds last month, Michigan cows are also the biggest producers in the country at 2,330 pounds a month. Three Federal Reserve Bank districts are out with their quarterly land values and credit conditions report. Unfortunately, they reveal a continuing slump of down prices in farm incomes. The Kansas City Fed revealing the farm economy deteriorating along with the latest downturn in commodity prices. The Fed reporting credit conditions eroding during the second quarter of the year with bankers reporting a modest increase in problems with borrowers repaying loans. There's also more demand for farm loans. The KC Fed says despite a 17% drop in U.S. soybean prices in June, the effect on farm income was somewhat limited. The value of irrigated cropland has seen the biggest decrease, down about 4% from a year ago. Ranch land values were also lower, but falling at the slowest rate since early 2016. They're down 2%. And the year-over-year -year decline in the value of non-irrigated cropland was the smallest since early 2015, down 1% from a year ago. Over in the St. Louis district, covering the southern Corn Belt and Mid-South, bankers say they have less volatility in farm income because it's based less on row crops and more on contract poultry growers. While prices are off their highs, they've stabilized. Quality farmland values fell 3.5% in the second quarter, but ranch and pasture land values climbed 1.6%. And land values appear to be holding fairly steady in the heart of the Midwest as well. Farmland values for the 7th Federal Reserve District edging up 1% in the second quarter from a year earlier. Wisconsin having the biggest year-over-year -year climb, up 4%. Illinois was the only state in the district that bankers reported a decline. It's down 2%. Later today, USDA is set to release a fresh crop report, but besides the normal uncertainty often associated with those releases, there's an added factor this time. This will be the first report released under new lockup rules at USDA headquarters. Reporters and media groups no longer get early access to the report. For decades, they've received it 90 minutes before the general public, giving news reporters and editors time to prepare their headlines and news summaries. Instead, Everybody will get it at the same time, a couple of seconds after the 11 a.m. Central Time release. When the Ag Department announced the change, Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue said giving journalists early access predetermines who gets the information first, which USDA says unfairly favored some traders. Now our partners over at AgWeb will post the data as soon as possible, assuming there are no problems with the USDA's website. 
While trade tensions remain high between the U.S. and China, other new USDA data showing U.S. soybean sales are already shifting to other parts of the world. That latest USDA data for June showing soybeans moving back to the Atlantic, the European Union, shipping more than 589,000 metric tons of soybeans in June, compared to just over 184,000 tons for the same month a year ago. The EU was the top destination for U.S. soybeans that month, well ahead of number two Mexico. However, Mexico also increasing their imports substantially in June from 322,000 last year to more than 485,000 tons this year. And Pakistan, which didn't import any U.S. soy in June of 2017, coming in at the number three spot. In June, it imported nearly 396,000 tons of U.S. beans. Now, according to Reuters, bean imports to China were off 8%, mostly due to increasing domestic stocks. Rice harvesting in South Louisiana is in full swing and will soon begin in the northern part of the state. Early yields are pointing to an excellent harvest, but that could quickly change if the weather does not cooperate. LSU Ag Center's Craig Gotro has this report from Southwest Louisiana. Rice producers finally caught a break from the weather this year and took advantage of the favorable growing conditions. With little more than a third of the crop harvested in southern Louisiana, farmers are reaping a bumper crop. The yields have looked exceptional uh, across the southwest. In fact, um, if we take our early yields, it looks like we may be near a record. That record was set in 2013 when farmers harvested nearly 7,300 pounds per acre. Harold said yields are running about 7,600 pounds right now, but cautioned that yields at the beginning of the harvest are higher than the final number. While drought conditions hurt many crops across the state, rice benefited from them. Now you would think that would be bad for rice, but in fact, if we can keep our irrigation water on the crop, um, growing rice in a drought situation is, is actually very good. For those farmers planning on growing a second or return crop of rice, they will need to finish harvesting their first crop soon. We would like to have those completed um, by August 15th. Now, we can go a little bit later with the harvest and still retune those acres, but you have a higher probability of getting caught in uh, cold temperatures. Growers with harvested fields are busy manipulating the remaining stubble to increase the yields of their second crop. And you'll see growers throughout southwest Louisiana doing this in a couple of different ways. They may go in with a uh, flail mower or a bush hog and, and mow that stubble down to about eight inches, or they may come in and roll it with a roller or a crumbler. Harold says manipulating the stubble can increase yields on the second crop rice by more than 700 pounds per acre. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. Mike Hoffman joining us with a look around farm country. He has today's crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. We don't talk about sunflowers very often, but it sure is a cheerful looking crop with the big yellow flowers. We found this patch in Peru, Indiana. It appears to be used in part as a feed plot for deer. Indiana doesn't grow a lot of sunflowers, but North Dakota does, about 450,000 acres. It's an important oilseed crop. According to NAS, the North Dakota crop is in fine shape this year. 80% is called good to excellent. 81% is blooming in North Dakota fields, well ahead of the 50% average. And take a look at the wind speed forecast. Boy, not a lot this morning. We're kind of getting into the doldrums at times of August, but scattered uh, thunderstorms will cause some winds in the southwest across parts of Texas as well. That'll continue in places into tomorrow morning, mainly in the southwest. And then as we head through the day, kind of more of the same. Few spots turn windy as well as the northwestern portions of the country. We'll have more on your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. Up next, we'll check Thursday's trade and talk about the wheat market with Naomi Bloom. And later, criminals beware, these cows are giving Florida cops a helping hoof when it comes to evading authorities. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing. Farmer first with a plan for every market. In agribusiness, it was a pretty wild day for both grains and livestock. Let's get details from our friends on the floor in the CME in Chicago. 
corn, soybeans, wheat all trending a little bit lower during today's session. Now moving over to the wheat, it's been a lot of talk about hot and dry weather in the Black Sea, Australia, and, and Europe, and concerns over crop production. We think ultimately this fear will subside, and it looks like price is telling that. We're running out of bullish headlines to continue to prop this market up, and I think ultimately represents a, a good selling opportunity. This has been Oliver Slope with Blue Line Futures. Wheat markets sputter on Thursday following rains in Europe, but what about recent trends? Tyne Morgan asks a question from the road in today's analysis. Here now with Naomi Bloom of Stuart Peterson. Naomi, let's talk about this wheat market last week. Who would have thought it would be wheat prices that carried corn prices higher. I know, it's just a phenomenal thing with the marketplace right now. We've seen lower production in little pockets all around the world, and that's what we had said all along would take it to make the market go higher, smaller production everywhere. So we've got production loss 25% in Germany, lower yields also in France and in Spain, and now we're hearing smaller supplies even in Australia, where if they don't get rain within the next three weeks, their production could be potentially now cut in half, which would be new wow. to the market. That's how dire it is with the rain situation there. So with prices today, we're up near resistance levels on charts for Chicago, Kansas, Minneapolis wheat futures. This is an opportunity to get some sales made because if that rain comes in Australia, we could see the market have a setback lower. Yeah, if this is a true weather rally, we know weather rallies don't last that long. So you're saying right now, producers don't miss this, this chance. Absolutely, make those cash sales, get some puts under the market because in order for prices to go higher, we would need the confirmation of, of supply destruction in Australia along with continued lower yields in other parts of the world. But do you think that's an option? Do you think that's possible that we do see higher wheat prices? Um, it would be possible if those global production levels go down without a doubt. And, and you, if you look back at 2002, 2003, heading into 2004, the lower wheat production levels around the world is what led the rally for all grains market ah. into 2004. Wheat leads the big rally, so it's something to watch. But if it rains, prices will probably slide lower. But what if you want to sell some wheat, but at the same time you want to leave some room for some of that upside potential? What is an option? Okay, so what you could do in that case would be to um, buy calls to let the market go higher. And then I would say go out to December of 2018 or potentially go out into March or July of 2019. The volume gets less in those years, ah. so it's trickier. Um, but I would say you could probably go with December for the short term. All right, Naomi yeah. Bloom, thank you so thank you. much. Fun to talk about wheat here on Ag Day. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more Ag Day when we come back. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779 or visit stuartpeterson.com. Welcome back to Ag Day, meteorologist Mike Hoffman looking at the drought monitor here, Mike. And really, it's you know still pretty bad in the western half and southern, southwestern part of the country, but spotty. Yeah, the, the worst area is the southwest, but they're typically dry. But from Texas all the way up to northern Missouri, you can see there are areas of extreme to exceptional drought. And of course, if you're in one of those areas, it doesn't matter that it's spotty. It's really bad where you are. But there are other places that have had some rain, and they're on the dry side, but just not overly bad. We'll continue to watch those areas, but it uh, looks like a little bit of a wetter pattern for Texas and Oklahoma over the next couple of weeks, just so you know. Here's the way things looked four weeks ago. You can see not quite as widespread, so we have increased some, especially in Texas, as you'll notice as we head through the past couple of weeks. But like I said, we're heading into a little bit of a wetter pattern as we head into Texas over the next uh, couple of weeks. So hopefully that will improve things marginally anyway. Here's the way the weather map looks. There's that stationary front across Texas. That will be the focus for showers and thunderstorms as well as the the low that is typical in the southwestern portions of the country or northwestern Mexico. Cool front will cause some spotty activity up across the southern and eastern Great Lakes into the Ohio Valley by later today. And the stationary front just kind of lays down there along the Gulf Coast. So uh, we will see areas of showers and thunderstorms, even some nighttime variety ones uh, as we head through the next uh, several days across uh, parts of Texas uh, and throughout the uh, southeast as well. Heading through the day tomorrow as we go through the first half of the weekend, some scattered showers and thunderstorms mid-Atlantic along that first or the second front and then the stationary front. Again, still some activity. And finally, a front coming into the Pacific Northwest. A few showers in places as we head through tomorrow. Here's the precipitation estimate past 24 hours. A lot of it has been mid-Mississippi Valley into the Tennessee Valley. 
parts of Florida as well. And then you add in the next 36 hours, we'll add more in Florida, add more along that stationary front into uh, northern Mexico, actually, and spotty through the Great Lakes and the northeast. High temperatures this afternoon, pretty hot through the central plains and uh, northern plains as well, but comfortable across the Great Lakes into the northeast. Low temperatures tonight going to drop off into the 60s in most of the Corn Belt, a few lower 70s, and then tomorrow kind of more of the same. Still fairly comfortable Great Lakes in the Northeast, but uh, pretty warm. Not as hot as usual, though, in many of the southern places. Here's the reason. We still have kind of a trough in the eastern part of the country. It cuts off over the lower Great Lakes as we head into early next week. That moves away. Another trough comes in to replace it. Ridge continues out west. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, Idaho Falls, Idaho, lots of sunshine, very hot today, high of 98. Jonesboro, Arkansas, warm, humid, and sunshine, high of 87. In Wheeling, West Virginia, partly sunny skies, a thunderstorm possible, high of 81. When we come back, we'll keep talking weather and the agronomy decisions that go with it. That's on Farm Journal College TV. And later, it's a bovine blitz as a herd of cows help wrangle a suspect on the run. Last week, I was on the road in Union City, Tennessee. I spoke with a couple of agronomists about challenges farmers faced in 2018. The answer is today's Farm Journal College TV. Larry, uh, tell me about uh, some of the agronomic challenges that growers have faced this year in this part of the country, and how do they fix it? You know, one of the things we dealt with early this year, Clinton, uh, particularly going into the planting season, we had areas that uh, received a lot more rainfall than we needed, so that always causes a delayed planting situation. And, those situations you're trying to decide whether to stay uh, in, in case of corn with a particular hybrid that you were going to start out with or do you need to change maturities as we get later into the season. So we had some challenges there. And if you have wet weather on corn, you're probably going to have wet weather on your early planted soybeans as well. So we did have some stand issues in places. We had to do a fair amount of replanting of soybeans in some situations. So we always get questions about if I'm delayed two or three weeks, do I need to plant the same maturity or do I need to choose an earlier maturity? And we normally tell them, can usually largely stay with the same maturity that you planted the first time. Your compression is going to be about 50% in terms of harvest, so you're usually okay. Stay with the same variety if you want to, up to about three weeks. After that, you probably need to start choosing an earlier variety if you're trying to match up maturities in a given field. Okay, and that's great advice. What about you know, over in Kentucky? Uh, Todd Ladd here, agronomist. What did you deal with this year, and, and what were some of the questions you got, and how do we fix it? We got a lot of rain back early. You know, our normal window of planting is usually that third week in March, you know, on. But this year, you know, there was times where we got a chance to plant, you know, had a lot of problems, a lot of stand issues. You know, ground was, was average at best, you know, just trying to get the crop in on timely fashion. And uh, had a lot of, lot of problems, you know, stand emerged and kind of getting a final, final uh, stand that people would, uh, would be willing to you know, to go forward with. Okay, so it was really about emergence and trying to get through that part of the part yeah, of the season. The yeah. getting getting things planted and getting crop up and growing and, and getting getting to where we need to be on, on as far as crop growth there. Is there a planner setting that you uh, had to adjust? Was it down pressure? Was it depth? What what did you guys do? I think a lot of them went back and changed their uh, packing wheels. Okay. They they changed the configuration around a little bit and got some different ones on to kind of help alleviate some of the sidewall compaction problems that that planting when it's cold and wet you usually face. When we come back, this Florida suspect can run, but she can't hide. A bovine bust after the break. In the Country, sponsored by the all-new Kubota Sidekick a utility vehicle that lets you climb more, cover more, tow more, and enjoy more. Visit KubotaUSA.com. A herd of 16 cows helped police officers in Florida corral a fleeing suspect who bailed out of a car and ran through a pasture. Signal for sipes and celery, bail out. The play-by-play -play straight off the silver screen in Florida, a Seminole County Sheriff's copter capturing the Sunday night caper on video as the crew radioed to officers on the ground. The fleeing woman, a Jennifer Ann Kaufman, trying to evade police, couldn't outrun a hungry herd. She might as well have carried a bale of hay through the darkened pasture as the riled cows pursued, helping the chopper above follow every move. Keep going southeast. Um, she's uh, pretty far into the field now. 
Um, if you see the large group of cows, they're, they're literally following her and uh, chasing her. The woman eventually crossing through the fence before being arrested. The arrest report showing the car Kaufman was in crashed during a police pursuit before being tracked down by those frisky bovine. A second suspect was captured by K-9 and arrested. Kaufman is being held on a $4,500 bond. Charges against her include resisting an officer and drug possession. No word on any possible reward for the assist from the pasture police, but runners beware that herd is on alert and ready to protect and serve the Longhorns of the law. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Spend part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Grivis. Have a great day.